people think that you tough because you rolling with tough dudes, mm -hmm. right? But the truth of the matter is the toughest dude is the one that can stand on his own and say, I ain't with it. Exactly. <laughs>
Cause I know I know I know enough to to go with some lawyers to mm-hmm. see mm-hmm. some police. They're telling me I'm a suspect for shooting a police officer. Mm-hmm. I don't even know that he's dead. He was dead on arrival. But um, so I'm thinking they might be taking me to a hospital bed. Officers gonna look at me and be like, "Yo, that's not him." Yeah. And so I go to the precinct and I find out they don't have a warrant for my arrest. And so my lawyers are like, you know what, go home. And I said, if I go home, what's gonna happen? I'm, I, I wanna play games with these cops. These are some serious charges and allegations they bring into me. I'm willing to go in there and give them whatever they want from me so that we can clear this up. And I wanna do it while you guys are still present. I don't wanna separate from you. There was a sense of fear, you know, because Absolutely. we, we, know, we, know, what, we know what they yeah. do. We're That's talking right. about the 90s. We, yeah. we know what they were doing back yeah. then. We, know exactly. yeah. you know, we had Abner Wema. We had all kinds of, yeah. we had punches yeah. going up dudes, yeah. rectums. Yeah. That was our yeah. you know, down here. Yeah, yeah absolutely, yeah. in Harlem. Uh-huh. So there was a lot of shady stuff happening, and I didn't want to be a part of it. Absolutely. Right? I knew that I could have walked away and, and, and left and went home. They could have grabbed drugs off of somebody, you know, and then said, yo, beat it, and then grabbed me up and say that I had drugs just to put me back in the system. So I wasn't playing with them. And, and so I went against my lawyer's advice. And I said, what is it that they want? And he was like, they want you to volunteer for a lineup. We're telling you as your attorneys, go home. Let them do their job and then let us do ours. And I said, I'm not playing games with nobody. I'm going in there. Let, tell them to pick their little fillers or whatever and let's do this lineup. I ain't got nothing to do with this. So they were like, you listen, we're telling you you should go home now. I said, nah, I'm going in there. And that's what I did. I volunteered for that lineup, and that was the last choice I made as a free man. Because from that point forward, I went to Central Booking, I went to Rikers Island, and then I went upstate. Mm. Wow. You know? So, so before we, you know, before we expound on that a little more, could you like just go back a little bit, and if you remember, if you can recall anyone back then, as as you you told us how you was running the streets and how you was in this place or that place, you know, in the Queens, in Manhattan, in the Bronx. Um, can you re- recall anyone that was influential in your life during that time? In no, a positive coming way? Up, in, a positive way. <laughs> in a positive way. In a positive way? In a positive way, yeah. Plenty, there were plenty of positive influences in my life because I, I came from good structure. Like, you know, like my mom's was a healthcare organizer for 1199 SEIU, which Absolutely. is a prominent union, you know, so there were a lot of people in 1199 it, like that gave me super love. Like my mom takes me to work. I've been on strikes and everything with them. Absolutely. So like, you know, there's always been friends and family around okay. that would always try to steer me the right direction. Yeah. You know, they had put me in parochial school, so I was going to Catholic school for a while. I had good structure there. You know, it was a lot of, I had a lot of opportunities that a lot of people didn't have. Mm-hmm. Then I had my pops and the rest of my family on that side. Mm-hmm. So it was a lot of positive influences okay. in my life. I wasn't necessarily a bad person. That's good you know what I'm saying? That's I was right. a good person who made bad choices. That's right. Mm-hmm. You see what that's I'm saying? saying? And that's what people need to realize about individuals that's in our communities. Because we become products of our environment and people think that that's an excuse, but Come live in our environment, and you'll see how real it gets. That's right. Because you're going to fall in line, too. That's right. You know, you get down or you lay down. It's going to be bad. That's right. Yeah. (laughs) So, I mean, you know, but despite all the positive peer influence that was available, there's also the lifestyle, right? And so when you go out and uh, and you hit the corners, the ballers ain't with all that positive shit. You know what I'm saying? They're doing negative things. But they're the ones living. And you see, like, yo, the only way a person could win is if they start cheating, mm-hmm. right? Absolutely. So you got to cheat the system. And at that age, you talk about 16, 17, 18, we too young to really realize. Right. We Black. think we're That's men, right. right? We think we're That's men, right. we but we're too all. young to really realize the significance of the choices that we're making at that point and the impact it's going to have. Awesome. I never knew that these little bullshit arrests was going to lead to me doing... 23 years, seven months, and eight days in prison for a crime I didn't commit, Mm -hmm. you know? And that's the message that we need to be sending out there is because just being with the wrong crowd, making the wrong choices, and getting caught up for some bullshit can destroy your life, destroy your family's lives. Like, I left two children behind at the age of three and five weeks. Mm -hmm. That's right. You know what I'm saying? When I came home, like, my kids are grown. That's right, 
You know what I'm saying? They're 28 and 25 now. Like, you know, sure. and I left my son at five weeks and three years old. Yeah. Yeah, I, and I think it comes to a point that now us as men, as formerly incarcerated men, to come up and step up to go and teach these young kids now that's misguided that's right. by these rap songs and, and these lifestyles that are portrayed by the media that mm -hmm. they think that, yeah, that's how they got rich. No, they, they got rich because they signed a contract because they sing they well. Were talking, they were telling they, the stories of other people. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. the, the, hook, the hook is that <laughs> all those people that we saw in those corners that was balling and all that, those are all the guys I met up north. Yeah, yeah. And they couldn't, they couldn't oh. drive the commissary. Uh huh. Oh, they so couldn't, they the, couldn't, they sure. couldn't wear yeah. diamonds on on, on, on their neck no more in, no. in prison. You know it, what I'm saying? Exactly. So all the fly clothes, everything that they were spending their money on, they got don't taken see that. from them. They don't see that. And part, some of these right. dudes spent the same time I spent yeah. in prison, oh, and absolutely. are just coming home now. So it's like you talking about having fun for a short run. Mm -hmm. Let's say six months, mm -hmm. up to maybe five years. Most people don't get past that. If you get past that, you're super lucky you're doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. And when I say doing something wrong, you know, you're probably telling on some people. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but the bottom line is that that's a short life, mm -hmm. right? Our lifespans encompass so much more than that. Mm -hmm. And so the pain and the misery and the suffering that comes with the consequences of those choices isn't worth it at the end of the day. Because, listen, <laughs> with the type of time that we did, sure. me, me and E, we, we did over, oh, we did decades, right? Yeah. So if we were to be making a meager salary, let's say 40, 50,000, I make double that now, but yeah. let's say 40, 50,000, right, yeah. a year, yeah. and you times that times 20 years, uh -huh. and the fact that that person would never have to spend a day in prison, uh -huh. that person is winning. Yep. As opposed to the individual who was balling, was close to being a millionaire, and he was chilling for two years yeah. and then spent 20 up north. That's right. You're so, listen, oh my God, you're so. So, when I was in the feds, right, I read a research that the federal government had done, right, on your average kid in the neighborhood at 16 years old that decides to go to school, get a job. Remember um, that McDonald's commercial? What, uh, what was his name? I read um, a similar study. I already uh, it. Okay. So, Calvin. Remember Calvin? Yeah, the commercial? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Calvin was with me in Green. But when I was in the Fed, they did this study, right? On your average 16 year old kid in the neighborhood that goes to school, get a little job, right? That mm -hmm. we all laughed at. Oh, look at this bum ass motherfucker going to the job. And you get your average 16 year old on the same corner that may get a temporary big paycheck at the end of the week to go buy a pair of Jordans. The lifespan, when I, and I talk to people, when you look at the lifespan of a five-year lifespan, how many times does that 16-year-old kid may end up in jail before he's doing a long bit, if not on the first time, okay, that posted that kid that still gets up in the morning, goes mm -hmm. to school, after school, go work a nine-to-five for a little measly uh, uh, minimum wage, right? In five years, he had built character, he had built consistency, he had built up some credit. At 10 years, he done went into a managerial position, never spent a day in, in, in jail, built up credit line, right? right? Which nobody thinks about the credit line, right? That's right. While that same kid has been in and out of freaking prison, if not doing a long stint. When you look at the eye, they go, oh yeah, but the drug dealer makes more money. But does he really? In the short term, yeah, he may get a grand today, but does that grand equate to doing 15 freaking years in prison? While that kid that's making maybe 285 a week times that for that 52 weeks. Triple that grand. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And never spent a day in jail. Mm -hmm. And have something yeah. to look forward to. Absolutely. And it's moving forward in life. And when you come home 20 years later, that person's pushing the bends. Exactly. And that's what. Mm -hmm. they, and you walking. Yeah. And these you got $40 go, in a bus ticket you trying to figure out your life. Up. Yeah. And get right back in there. And go right back to prison or you, die. You know, and so when, when we try to, you know, I, I, I do volunteer work and I talk to a lot of at-risk youth in, in, in prison and jail in Florida. Right. And, and, and when I go in there, I, I find it ironic that when I'm talking to them, like some of them are all joking and like, they are, I don't, I'm not paying no attention until I start speaking when I tell them my story. And they like... Mm -hmm. And then you see like the ones that want to raise their hand and really talk, but they're afraid and they wait till I'm about to leave and they come talk to me to the side and go, oh man, I wanted to raise my hand, I wanted to ask you something, but I didn't want to be the soft guy in the group. 
I'm like, go look yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, when are you going to be a fucking leader or are you going to continue to be a follower? That's right. Because you following this is where you're going to stay at. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I've done it for you. No, you don't have to truth. continue to go through this. Mm-hmm. Okay? And, and that's the message that we need to give out there to these kids. That's, that's right. right. Like, yo, the streets are the lie. The streets are the fucking lie. Bottom line. Not only Here, that, right? you made a strong <laughs> point, too. Whereas people think that you tough because you rolling with tough dudes, mm-hmm. right? But the truth of the matter is the toughest dude is the one that can stand on his own and say, I ain't with it. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And that, that, you know what that's what separates. So if you fall into peer pressure, mm-hmm. then you ain't really about nothing. Mm-hmm. But if you can stand on your own two feet and say, yo, listen, I'm standing 10 toes in the ground and this is who I am, mm-hmm. like it or not, mm. like, that's the person that you really need to start looking up to. Like, Tell me about that first night. Let's go back real quick to, what was it, January 28th? January, January 27th, 27th, 1998. When I you was walked living in my there. life. I didn't even know that this happened. It I, wasn't until uh, January 31st that I had found out that they were looking for me because my father had recently passed away. I lost my father and my freedom 10 months apart, right? So my father had passed away in 1997. Yeah, and, 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 yeah thank you. And in 1998, this is happening. So my driver's license was still addressed because I had my driver's license since I was young. It was still addressed to my father's address. Mm -hmm. So they went there first and they tried to grab my brother. I have a brother from my father's side, right? And so they tried to grab him, but he was only 16 years old. And they, you know, like they realized this isn't him. Right. So he left the card and said, listen, when you, when you speak to him, let him know that, you know, he's a suspect for a serious crime for shooting a police officer. Mm-hmm. You know, so when, when I got that information, I was messed up. But I also knew how serious that could be, like in terms of these people catch me in the street. They might gun me down in the mm-hmm. street if they, if they running around with my picture mm-hmm. talking about I did this. Mm-hmm. So I needed to get a lawyer right away and get right into that precinct mm-hmm. and get this shit you know like solve Let, let's deal with this shit quick because i ain't got nothing to do with it All right and that's basically when it took place so when you went to go do that lineup and they're like you're going through the system that was like, february 2nd 1990 what was you what was going through your mind i was i was messed up man like the reality is a lot of that i won't be able to really put together and fathom because there's mm-hmm. so much trauma associated with that that I had to bury in order yeah. to survive my circumstances oh, behind absolutely. the wall. You know what I'm saying? It was like, you know, behind the wall, you ain't got time to be thinking about nothing else except survival, right? And then the other part of what I had to, to balance survival with was how do I get out of here? Right. Because this, this can't be my life. Mm-hmm. You know, I always used to remember Jay-Z's song, this can't be life. Absolutely. I'm looking at that first night in prison, yeah. when you actually have the time now and you sentence, like just that mind capacity. And I, I ask this because mm-hmm. I remember when I received 25 years of life, I was 20 years old. I did it. Mm-hmm. I was still fighting for my freedom. I was still in denial. Right. You know what I'm right, saying? Right, right. And I was still, um, I was still following these this distorted value system that I call, mm-hmm. you know, growing up in the streets Absolutely. of the Bronx. You know what Absolutely. I mean? And so. When I did get locked up in that first night in Clinton, mm-hmm. 1994, I remember April, it was snowing. You know, we thought they had their own snow machine. When I got there, I'm like, what the, you know, right, but, right. but just going in and locking in that cell, I remember telling myself, like, I don't want to do this no more, man. I don't want to do this, this life, this yard, because I already been to the Rikers Island, the four building, and, you know what I mean? And, 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 Clicking up, yeah. so like, just what was that capacity, that mind capacity of yours when you first received that, and yeah. you know you like, were innocent. Yeah, but so when I first came upstate, man, I was bitter, I was pissed off, I wanted almost like my mentality was almost like, if I'm gonna do life in prison, I might as well justify it, mm-hmm. that's what, right? That's right? So I had the wrong mentality coming up at first. Yeah. You know, that, and that, that is just a product of the trauma, right? Because that wasn't who I was. 
And if I would have allowed that, that mentality to continue, I would have turned into an animal, like a beast, the people that they like to talk about, mm -hmm. right? That's and the crazy right. part is that I wasn't even guilty. Yeah. But your circumstances can do that to you. Yeah. And, and when people right. oppress right. you right. in a way like that, they can change you, right? right? And my mother started to see changes in me because she was coming through hard body like every week with my kids. And so my mother and my kids kept me grounded, right? Because I'm like, yo, I don't want to be seeing them from the box. I, was, I, I, went, I came upstate from the, from, from the Bing on yeah. Rikers Island. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so like, I knew what that was already. And I'm like, yo, I'm not going to keep putting them through this where they're going to have to see me you know, like, through a glass or, or non-contact oh, visits and, and all this other stuff. When I came up north seeing the visiting room, like, I'm like, wait a minute, this is different from the island. You could get up, you could go to the machine, you could walk around. There's levels of freedom. And then there was the family reunion program, right? right? So it was, there was this, 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 this choice that I had to make. Am I going to make prison my home or am I going to fight to get home and focus on my family and what I can do to be a father from behind the wall, to be a son to my mother from behind the wall? You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. And so what my mother taught me was very valuable when she started to see that I was like kind of like my humanity was disintegrating because I was allowing the, the institution to institutionalize me. Right. And so I turned around and, you know, I explained to my moms what I was going through because she started asking me questions that, I, that made me uncomfortable because you don't want to tell your mother what's happening Absolutely. behind the wall, right? right? And so um, essentially... It came to a point where she was like, Jay, you need to recognize that they can lock up your body, but they can't lock up your mind. Mm. Up here, you can remain free, right? And when she taught me that, that empowered me. Mm -hmm. That empowered me because it made me realize that between a stimulus and a response, uh -huh. I have the freedom to choose. Yes, you do. And so that's I how I express my language. freedom. <laughs> Yeah, just Even though I'm incarcerated. Just taking a sec, big up the moms, man. Yeah, yeah big up I, to I my swear, moms. Maria Velasquez, she's yeah. the champ for real. My hero. And so, you know, like, the bottom line was when I realized that I did have a certain sense of freedom, mm -hmm. that, that really excited me. And so at that point, I started to say, yo, I got to make conscious choices. And you know, later on down the line at Sing Sing, because th this, was, this was happening in the Have, where That's I was right. coming to this level of consciousness, Absolutely. because there were some conscious brothers, progressive. old school progressive right. dudes. Was, that was the school of Eddie Ellis and all the, these other dudes right. that really paved the path for That's us, right. right? We was hearing about Julio Absolutely. Medina back That's then, right. going, the going in front of President Bush That's and getting right. the grant and doing his thing after doing 10 years. Right. You know, so like, you start to see that, and it's like, you know what? We could be that. Mm. I could be that. Mm -hmm. Right? Because I've always had this sense of magnetism where dudes like to follow me. Right? Mm. And so the old timers used to see me and it was like, yo, you kind of got this yard. Like, you could move the yard. Right. But why don't you move them into J school? Why don't you take them down here? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm going to take them down here to do what? And they were like, we're going to give you this back room back here. We'll give you a VCR. We'll get you some movies. You, you could do some positive shit. But, you know, like... You have to do something to make it meaningful. Mm -hmm. Don't just come down here and yeah. sat rap with these dudes mm -hmm. and, and just watch movies and chill. That can be part of it. So it was like dangling the carrot to Absolutely. get some of these guys out the yard. Absolutely. But then we started to realize, like, all right, let's let's watch a movie and then let's let's figure out where dudes is going wrong and how dudes could change that situation. Mm -hmm. And let's write about that. And so we started a, like a little literacy project helping dudes write, because I was always strong in writing. I was always strong in articulating, you know, my purpose or what it is that we need to do. Absolutely. And once I've, I lock into something, that's I'm it. going. You're it's zero going. to 100, yeah. right? And, think tanks. Yeah, and that's, that's exactly right. what we did. We started developing think tanks for younger dudes, because the older dudes was already in a swing they, of it. Yeah, it was in their lane. How many years before did it take? 
five years was like my my my, that, my like turning five, point. That five year t- turning yeah. point. Most right. people, some people take longer. Some people That's go to like about ten years before the they get mm-hmm. to that turning point, that impetus, mm-hmm. that where you change your trajectory, right? Mm-hmm. But because I had old timers that saw something in me. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's the problem too, is that a lot of our people don't see their own value, right? And it's important when you look in that mirror to see your own value and know your value, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Because without that, you can't be successful. I know my value, which is why when I'm out here, everybody else can see it. Right. You know, and, 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 and that's another thing. Like, I learned this later on in life, but I was actually practicing it prior and I learned this from Dan Slepian, who is a producer from Dateline, that right. is my other hero, right? This is yep. the dude that, the reason Dan why too, I'm here, right? right? <laughs> the reason why I'm free today and able to speak like this. Um, he said, you know how most people like that saying, yeah, I see it when I believe it. You tell somebody like, I, I, was, in, I was in the White House speaking yeah. to President Biden representing the people for criminal legal reform in October. Mm. If I would have told somebody while I was in prison, when I get out, when in my first year, I'm going to be in the White House advocating for the people. They'd be like, yeah, I yeah, see yeah, it when yeah. I believe it, right? Uh-huh, uh-huh. But the truth of the matter is, it happened because I believed it. Mm. You have to believe it mm. to see it. Absolutely. It's the opposite way. That's right. Real you can't good. see nothing that you don't believe. We talk about that all the time. Because it could be right in your face. If you don't believe in it, you ain't going to see it. And, 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 and I think that, that's one of the biggest problems with our society and some of our people, right? We rather impress the wrong crowd instead of separating ourselves and becoming the crowd that people want. We to create be. our own crowds, right? man. And, 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 and that's the difference, right? And I tell people all the time, like they used to make fun of me. I had a, I had a cellmate that used to always tell me, yo, why I gotta wake up every morning and look at all this positive shit here around the mirror? Mm-hmm. Right? Cause I used to put positive affirmation because I had to change That's my right. mindset from being viewed as Scarface mm-hmm. to becoming Anthony, to becoming one to become Mr. Cologne, mm-hmm. right? A business Absolutely. owner, entrepreneur, right? I had to believe those things because I was taught for so long and I embedded it in my own fucking mind mm-hmm. that I was. I was no good, that I was just a gangster, I was I was a thug, I was a tough guy, I was an idiot, mm-hmm. I was a, a high school dropout, right? I had, and I believed all that. So I had to reshift my mindset and how I believed in me Absolutely. because no one was going to view me better than the way I view myself, and the way that I viewed myself was down here. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't until I started to view myself up here that people was like, oh, sweat, Damn, you're not Scarface no more, man, you're, mm-hmm. you're Anthony, you're, wow, you're Mr. Cologne. Mm-hmm. Right? And those positive affirmations and rechanging your mind to Absolutely. believe who you really are. Absolutely. Right? Because we want to impress the crowd that are still banging, blazing, they're doing this, they're doing that. We want to be a part of that crowd. But when you're doing that time in the bing or you're getting locked up, or you, nobody wants to be a part of that crowd no more. Right? Sometimes when we see something, that changes things. You know what I mean? That changes us as a person. And I, the, the reason why I say that is because when I came up, the level of violence that I, I seen mm-hmm. changed me a lot, too. That's right. and, and I think it changed me to, to help me uh, uh, cope with just not wanting to, to hurt the next man that's in the position that I'm in. We, we, all, in the same, we all in this same pot, you that's know right, what I mean? Right. And so, um, you know, for you, I just asked a question. Like, what was that worst thing, if there ever was, like, where, where you was at, up in upstate, wherever you were, um, that, that worst level of violence that you ever witnessed, and, and, and how did it change you? Because we all, there's different components yeah, of trauma, and we all have those times. I've been around I three remember. bodies that dropped in prison. And that's what I want to no, no, hear. I'm like, talking about natural death. Right, right. We're talking about dudes getting killed in the yard. Two dudes it, was, it happened in the yard. One time it happened right in Seven Building in the in the block at Sing Sing. Mm-hmm. I was there for that body, wow. you know. Yeah. And uh, and so I mean, I've seen all kinds of shit. I've seen riots. I've seen police, you know, smash a dude out way past what that was supposed to be. But we all locked behind the gate, yeah. you know. Like there's a lot of stuff there. To get graphic with it isn't really going to suffice anything. The bottom line is you're absolutely right. It's a super violent area. 
and it, and, and, and the trauma the trauma that comes from that is very serious Absolutely. you know what i'm saying and if you're not built for certain things that shit could break you you know what I'm saying? That shit could break you. I seen a dude get murdered for a drug debt that was received when we came off a of lockdown. So he got bodied for nothing. You see what I'm saying? And so there's a lot of senseless violence that goes on regularly. You know, I remember seeing through a dude's mouth because his shit got split. You know, like there's a whole lot of that we could talk about. And but but the important part is what you touched on right. is the trauma that comes from being in an environment like that and that trauma is still real today because here i am i came home right Absolutely. and 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 you know like i'm i'm a humble dude i'm peaceful right. but i got an aggressive a uh, streak in me too and and that's that's that that's that like that defense mechanism that we have because if you see a dude is not willing to listen to you then you have to like wake them up and say, yo, I'll see you right. like eye to eye where you want to be seen if that's where it's going to go and it has to go. Yeah, some but, people really respect but, that violence. Yeah, that's violence. like the, all they respect. Exactly. You know right. what I'm saying? But the truth of the matter is you usually can talk your way out of a situation. The one thing that I learned and that kept me from getting the scars that, I, you know, that most people come home with. Very important. You know, mm -hmm. is that don't approach a person in public. If there's a situation you see a dude has a problem or he violated you in some way, catch him when he's by himself and speak to him man to man, look him in his eye and tell him this could go one or two ways. Right. There's no show. There's nobody here. Mm -hmm. And when we walk away, if that's what we decide to do as men, nobody has to talk about it. I'm not one of these dudes that's going to be pissing somebody's ear like, yeah, I bitched him out. Right. It's not yeah. about that. Right. Being stand up but about it. man to man right now, we don't have to put on a show for nobody. What is it that we're doing? Are we going to continue to live in this environment in peace? Mm -hmm. Or do we both have to leave here now? Right. And that usually lets an individual walk away. Because you're telling them, I don't want any problems. But at the same token, I don't want to feel like I have to watch my back. Right. Right, that so man to man right now, we can make a decision as to what we're going to do. We either don't leave right now. Or we deal with it, you know, like like okay, immature, like we, a, we just immature little kids. Yeah, basically. sometimes, sometimes it comes down to, and he knows this. Mm -hmm. It happens with a lot of guys mm -hmm. where you yeah. just never look at each other again. You don't mm -hmm. even talk to each other. Mm -hmm. You ain't got to look down or nothing because right. you're a man. Yeah. But like, you just keep walking right past an individual. We don't have no words for each other no right. more right. because we we don't get along or we don't see eye to eye for whatever reason. Right. But does that really have to end in in bloodshed? Do I really have to shed your blood to prove to you that I'm a man? I'm a man standing in front of you right now telling you that it could happen. Right. But it doesn't have to. Right. And f for real, I don't want to because w once I started learning, I told you I, st I started early. Right. At that five-year stage, when I started learning that there was more value in my life, right, and that I was valuable, and that there were things that I needed to do as a father. I needed to get back to my children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My mother was getting older. She's taking care of my children. I need to be a son for her and help her because, you know, like, mm -hmm. we be getting it twisted sometimes. Like, mm -hmm. we always, like, there's a lot of people from our community that all they care about is themselves. That's right. But if, if my mother was busting her ass taking care of me all these years, then it's my job now to turn around and do my best to be there for her, yep, that's right? right. Uh, like I, the Asian people grow up, that's their culture. Yeah, yeah. We grow up and it's like, we can't wait to get away from them. Like, and it's like, how do, how do you do that? Now, some people have different relationships with their parents where their parents weren't there for them. Right. And that's how they ended up in prison. And so that's a different story and it's also understandable. But there's always somebody in our lives mm -hmm. and we need to be able not only to give them the credit, but show them that love. Like, yeah. oh, we become so numb. I became numb in prison for a while. Even mm -hmm. after the five-year turnaround trajectory and everything else, it was still this sense of numbness, right? right? Because you're, you're putting so much down. It's like the trauma from the violence, the trauma right. from, you know, uh, not only the violence of, you know, uh, um, incarcerated people on incarcerated people, you got to worry about staff. Staff is the most dangerous element in prison 
because they could bust your ass and then give you a charge mm -hmm. for trying to bust their ass. Oh. And all you was trying to do is protect yourself. And half the time, dudes is restrained and can't even protect themselves and That's still right. catch a charge yeah. for assault. So, like, you can get <laughs> set up on top of getting messed up. Yeah. You know I, what I'm saying? I, and so you start to learn. Like, I remember, and you might remember, um, Eddie, yeah, knock him dead. He, you know, yeah. he may never come home, right? But I remember one time I was on the gate pissed off with police and I'm beefing with him. And I'm over here inviting him to my, to my joint and everything, right? Mm -hmm. And Ed was my neighbor. He started banging on my wall. And he like, yo, homie, not for nothing. I hear you. I know that you know a lot of people do this and you're young. He said, but what you really asking for? Do you really want to step out this cell, get restraint? You might get a few shots off, but then you're going to get restraint. They're going to whip your ass while you restraint. You're going to go to the box. You're going to catch a new charge. Like, is this what you really asking for? Because when you're on a gate beefing yeah. and telling them, crack my gate, this is what I'm going to do to you, that's what you're asking for. Trust me. You know, and, and, and this is a real dude who's never going home that if I came out, he would come out with me. Right. Just because he got nothing to lose. Mm. But he was basically saying, that's that's for me. Right. That's my life because I ain't going home. Right. That's not your life, bro. You know. You don't even belong here. It's funny. You know, I, I was in a situation in Attica and I ran into a brother named Green Eyes. Remember when I first got to Attica, me and this kid, you know, we just hit it off. Mm -hmm. Name's uh, Joseph Velasquez, too. Like, we just, you know, you just meet that dude first time in the yard, and it's just like, yeah. oh, shit, like, you know. Yeah. And I was almost into a situation, and I went out there strapped up, and he comes to me, and he's like, yo, I'm, I'm with you, right? And as we talking, we got our backs in, in the middle of the yard. He, we, we just kind of talking to each other. He's like, yo, how much time you got, squad? And I'm like, yo, I'm, like, I've got another three years. He's like, yo, are, are you, Hold on. He turns around and he's like, yo, are you bugging? He's like, yo, I'm never getting out of here. You got a chance to get out of here. Yo, come on, let's go talk about this, what's going on. Just getting this straightened out. Cause we either both going to either die or kill. And we went and addressed the situation to come to find out my name was mixed up, confused with somebody else. And when I, and I, and I talked to the people out there, it's like, yo, all bad. We just heard the name Scarface and we thought you was, and the thing was smashed from there, but it showed me that, you know, there's some amazing good brothers that's willing to stand for you, right? Mm -hmm. But the conversation. That's the key. The conversation. Yeah, that's the key. Is, you know, because who knows where I would have been today had it would have got there without me inquiring what the situation was. Mm -hmm. I just heard the buzz, yo, at Scarface, Scarface, and I'm like, no. And it's like, wow. So when you say that, and you know, even when you look at the news and everything that's going on, look at the five cops that just beat that brother to death. I was watching videos mm -hmm. of that this morning, right? Black cop, thing. white cop, it don't freaking make a difference, right? When you put yourself in a situation, if you don't address it right, and you look at this, now everybody's just challenging people, right? And I tell people all the time, listen, we're living in a world right now that mental disorder is heightened. Mm -hmm. You don't know what a person is thinking, whether they're a cop, whether they're an ambulance person, whether they're a professional, right. whether they're a thug, Absolutely. whether you never know what a person is thinking. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't put yourself in a situation to, to push that envelope, like, yo, you got to be more conscious today before you're putting yourself out there. You, you touched on two important things that need to be discussed, right? And one of them is we, we, all these stigmas, these labels that we put on people, mm -hmm. what we need to realize is that simply they're people. Mm -hmm. So we're all human, right? And we all suffer in different ways. Some of us suffer in similar ways. It doesn't matter whether you're a police officer, whether you're a judge, whether you're a convicted uh, um, you know, individual, um, it doesn't matter what lot you had in life. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, if you're a breathing individual, you're a, you're a human being. And we need to see each other in that light, right? And so that, that's a lot of the framework and the foundation behind the work that we were doing there and the work we're doing now. And the reason why you guys have this podcast, right? Yeah. Success after lockdown is to say, don't, don't treat me like an individual who's formerly incarcerated treat me like an individual period mm -hmm. 
because we can be successful too. Right. And, and, and so some of us are be, being successful. Absolutely. And the truth of the matter is um, the reason why we're successful is because we're banding together now. That's right. Right. So that's that's important. The other part, I, I, I kind of lost it. But um, the other part that you were talking about was what? The mental health. You, you was talking about mental health, but there was it was something else you clicked on that was like real powerful. That I didn't want to cut you off. Just on him and that brother, also that brother, also addressing that. Yo, communication. Communication, communication, communication is the other key. Yeah, so the right. reason why so many problems take place in our communities, and you know our community could be Attica or Clinton if we're incarcerated, right? right? Those are still communities. Right. So, it, despite what community you're in, the reason why a lot of the problems that that individuals have between each other is because they haven't learned how to communicate effectively. Mm -hmm. So I get frustrated because I'm not getting my point across mm -hmm. to you and I start speaking a certain way and then you start speaking to me a certain way as well and now we're not even speaking to each other. Maybe we're speaking at, at each, each other, other. Yeah. And, and the words are going right past yeah. this and all yeah. we're thinking about is the minute you lift your hand, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. in your mouth. Size you you know, like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's yeah. like, you know, if, if we can take the time out and and, and particularly reach out to our, our younger people yeah. in the communities, right? Mm -hmm. And start teaching them the power of that communication, teaching them how to communicate their emotions effectively. Absolutely. We can prevent a lot of problems from taking place. Absolutely. The same way that you are able to talk through that situation, mm -hmm. the yeah. same way I've been able to talk through multiple situations for multiple people. I have saved people's lives in prison mm -hmm. because I know how to communicate. Mm -hmm. Once I find out what your problem is, I'm gonna go over there and find out what his problem is, and then I'm gonna bring you two guys together, and I'm gonna show you how stupid and express that. Yeah. you and guys was about to get, Absolutely. and how smart you can be to walk away. Yeah. We did a lot of things together. Absolutely. We did a lot of productive things and, and behind, that behind that wall together, world. that's right. And, and, and it was not only for the prison population, mm -hmm. it was for the community, community and society, society as a That's whole right. mm -hmm. with the limited resources that we had, right? right. And, right. And, and that was, you know, that's, that's golden to mm -hmm. me, you know what I mean? And, and just wanting to say that, you know, express that. Absolutely. And I want, I want to feel your, your spirit on that day, just that day. You know, when it was not over, but that transition was to take place with you coming home, that day that oh, you came man. home. Just, just just, discuss that yeah, for a minute, man. For sure, man. Like, that was the best moment in my life, man. You know, like, you don't know what you have until you lose it. Uh -huh. Like, you, you have an idea, but... We spent years behind the wall just thinking about all the opportunity we lost. Just thinking about like, you know, what it's really like to live and the people that were in our lives that really cared about us, right? And, and, and you know, we took it all for granted when we were young. Mm -hmm. It was like, yeah, you know, tomorrow that'll be there and then you just keep putting it to the side. And so that they were like things that I wish I did, right? And all that. but. That moment when I was out the door, and y'all gonna see it soon because all of this is coming in film. Like, you know, there's a lot of things coming up in my future right now, but like I was able to grab my, my moms and my two sons. My oldest son who spent, who cycled through prison like it was the Mall of America from the age of 15 to 27, was finally out. And like, he just came and bear hugged me. And then my mom's on top of it. Then my other son, who's taller than all of us, he's the youngest, and just came over the top. And we just held each other for so long. And I just remember my mother, like, she was screaming, crying, but it was tears of joy. Mm -hmm. and, and that moment, I felt so much peace. There was a sense of healing that I can't even explain. That like, all that trauma, all that drama, it, for, for one moment in time, when I crossed that gate and held my family, it was just like there was so much peace mm -hmm. resonating inside my soul, right? And then um, from there, like, 
he knows I, I was working for Hudson Lee for higher education in prison, helping dudes get degrees, right, after I got my degree. And um, so Hudson Lee for higher education's office is right down the block from the prison. So when I get there, man, there were so many dudes I did time with, so many family members, so Sean many Peter, friends. Hudson and, yeah, family. Yeah, Absolutely. <laughs> we just had them yesterday here, Sean. Big up to Sean. Big up to Sean Pika and everybody else who was there September 9th, 2021, yeah. waiting for me to come out. I appreciate Absolutely. all of y'all on some real shit. Like, it was like, there was so much love and the people were there. Mm. And it was like, I'm, I'm coming out of, out of this SUV limo, pulling up, and it's just like, everybody was going crazy. I stuck my head out the window, gave everybody a big salute. Man, yeah. When I came out, it was just so many people. I mean, like, we could spend this whole... I'm still Podcast. upset I, I couldn't Same make names. it, man. I, I'm still yeah. upset I couldn't make it, Word, man. man. It was great. And then so we chilled there for a while. And then later on, so before I left Sing Sing the last few years, and he was able to do that too before he left, we was in Honor Block together. And so from Seven Building, we have our own little yard that sits up on this specific place in Sing Sing where you could just look at the Hudson River. And it's like, it's a beautiful sight. There's a bench that you can sit there and just stare out there for hours. And I always used to stare across the water. Mm -hmm. And so um, they were doing a documentary. At the time, um, NBC was, was, was working with Rock Nation to do a joint um, documentary, follow-up documentary on the, on the previous documentary that was aired in 2012 about my journey in, with wrongful convictions. This one was like, yo, he's still there. And, um, you know, the project got sapped by COVID, but right before then, you know, they had taken my mom's on the other side of the water and had her talk about her dream seeing me come home on the other side of the water looking at the prison. And then they came in and they filmed me talking about me wishing to get to the other side of that, of that water because my mother's over there, right. right? Because my mother was actually living on the other side of that water. And so, like, staring at that for me is different because I seen this is my family's on the other side of that water. It's not just, you know, like trees and houses. Right. That's home. Right. Right? That's my new home when I get out. Mm -hmm. And so Absolutely. I used to see it, right? Mm -hmm. And I believed it. And that's why I got it. So the day I got out, it. that Absolutely. evening, they rented a restaurant on the other side of the water from Sing Sing. And so everybody was over there. Um, Manny that was with us, Manny and my son yeah. Mikey that was also with me in the Have, we, we, they took me shopping real quick just to change up real quick and get something yeah. on that fit. Because yeah. you know you're asking yeah. for things, yeah. and they fit, but they don't fit right, right? right? right. Yeah. Um, and so they took me shopping real quick, and then we went to go meet everybody else over there. And, man, it was just, that was community. That was family. Yeah. That was love. And... I mean, I've been to events since I've been home. I've been to all kinds of, you know, different, you know, situations in life where, you know, you get to experience joy. But I don't know if anything will ever add up to that again. Once again, big shout out to the Hudson Link family. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. Hudson Link for life. It's a <laughs> lifestyle. Big shout That's out right. to, to, to everyone that actually heard your story that got involved. Because now, like... What, what is John Adrian Belez up to these days now? What is it that you giving to the community? What is it that you're doing now? I mean, so much lost time. Yeah, absolutely. And like, we're here now, right? Absolutely. And I know it's like, but it's like, you know, you, you see that poster where the lights is just like flashing. Mm -hmm. And it's like, all right, are we, are we slowing it down to actually see the lights? Or are we like, tell us like, yeah, no doubt. Um, for real, like, it started inside for me, right? Um, it was a seed that was planted when my mom had told me what she told me. And when she planted that seed when, and, and my trajectory changed, it was all about, like, there was so much shame attached and associated to incarceration. Whether you're guilty or not, like, my, my kids have to say my father's in prison. Uh -huh. My mom has to say my son's in prison. Mm -hmm. And some people will believe that I'm innocent and some people may not, right? Mm -hmm. So there's this shame that's, that, that's there. And the only way that I can turn that trauma into triumph, mm -hmm. right, and overcome my suffering 
is by making people proud of me. And so we started doing that inside. We found innovative ways. We thought outside the box mm -hmm. to figure out ways to do that from the inside, <laughs> right? And, and so um, one of the major things that we were able to accomplish was we developed Voices from Within. Mm -hmm. And so Voices from Within was our movement to redefine what it means to pay a debt to society. Right. Initially, we, we started off as Forgotten Voices. EB knows that. Absolutely. But we, we channeled into Voices from Within. And so um, I was able to bring... Dan Slepian, who's a supervising producer at NBC, into the prison to work with guys of like minds, right? There was 11 of us. It started at 17 when we were Forgotten Voices, and then we went down to 11, because dudes started going to different spots. You know, dudes was getting short. Like, everybody that we did time with is pretty much home now. Right. You know, there's a, right. a few unfortunate guys still in there. We trying to get them out, and I'm about to talk to all that and speak to that soon. Um, the reality is we created this mission, Voices from Within, and I'm rolling it out now. I got nine attorneys working with me right now, pro bono, in the development of this, right? But when I first came home, based on the work that I was doing on the inside, we had senators coming in. We had all kinds of public officials coming to speak to us because we were saying, yo, listen, it's not enough. Redefining what it means to pay a debt to society had nothing to do with innocence or guilt. It has to do with humanity, uh -huh. right? And so... Um, the reality is, is that we were reaching out to the communities, reaching out to, you know, public officials and saying, yo, there's individuals in here that were once part of the problem. They were the, they were the domestic terrorists in your community, mm -hmm. but they have matured. Mm -hmm. And in that level of maturity, now they want to give you insight so that you can have foresight to protect society, mm -hmm. right? right? Because we have hindsight based on our experiences. And so when you use those different levels of vision, uh -huh. you're able to refocus the lens, right. the social That's lens, right? right? That's right. And so we were able to give them the truth, like the things that they needed to hear, uh -huh. to be able to save people's lives. And so now, being out there, that's exactly what we're doing. Being an asset to your community. Exactly. We, 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 we turn liabilities into assets. That's what that, we do. We transform lives. And that, that was the mission at Hudson Link for Higher Education, right? And so since I've been home, you know, my first month out, I was offered a job as the program director for the Frederick Douglass Project for Justice. And so the Frederick Douglass Project for Justice doesn't even exist in New York. They were giving it to me to start here in New York. It's, it exists in D.C., but it's a multi-state program. So we, what we do essentially is we believe in proximity, right? And we believe that proximity matters to the point whereas if you haven't gone inside of a prison and met incarcerated individuals, then you shouldn't feel like you have the right to speak about mm -hmm. things that you don't understand. To know is to experience. And if you want the experience, I'll bring you into a prison. Yeah. I'll sit you down and we'll have facilitated meetings between community members and incarcerated individuals. And we can learn from each other, right? We can connect on a real level yeah. in real time, time where you can ask real, real questions and get real answers yeah. from people who understand the impact of crime and incarceration like no one else. Absolutely. And take that to the bank instead of what you hear on the news yeah, right. or what you see in movies, yeah, right. right? Because this shit is real. Yeah, and right. so what, what I am is, 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 is an advocate for truth, right? And so I've been able to utilize the skills that I cultivated inside, and now I'm using it outside with like crazy levels of resources to go back inside and start changing people's lives in there and out here, because there's people out here that need to be changed That's too. Right. And sometimes that trip inside can change how you view things. Right. Because change people out here drinking and driving and you could end up taking somebody's life and you could destroy yours. Uh, there's a lot of different things that can happen to individuals out here that would change your life in the blink of an eye. Uh -huh. My story is the testimony. Right. I was walking around living my day-to-day -day life the next day I was incarcerated for a murder yeah, that I didn't even right. know took place. Right. So right. your life can change. It can happen to yeah. you. In a heart you know what I'm saying? And, yeah. and so people need to start becoming a lot more conscious. And so raising consciousness is my move. And yeah, inside they called me Blaze. But I've, I've rebranded myself. I'm JJ for justice now. 
because that's all I'm doing. I'm a proponent for justice and truth. I'm out there and I'm giving it to these people. And I, I've been going all across different states. I remember one of, one of my craziest moments I did in 10 days, I traveled through four states, three time zones, went to four different prisons, and then landed a talk in Denver, giving people my stand. And my stand was taking a stand for, for humanity. That's, yeah. that was, it was like a TED talk, Absolutely. right? And I'm, I'm giving it to the people and letting them know what my experience is so that they can pull on the heartstrings of an individual who's innocent, mm -hmm. but it was so that you could see through the reflection of my eyes that even the guilty deserve to be treated with human right. dignity, right? right? Yeah. And, and so that's the message that I continue to push out there Absolutely. so that the doors of mass incarceration can start opening and, and, and it doesn't have to be so massive anymore, right? Because uh, E and I were in prison when, when it was at a peak of 71, 72,000 under Pataki. Mm -hmm. And quietly, people don't give Cuomo the respect that he deserves, uh, at least to what he did with us. That's Closed right. 11 prisons, right? That's right? And brought the population down to 31,000. Quietly. That's right. And these dudes ain't recidivating no more because we holding them down. Right. We holding each other down, right. which is something that changed. Because back in the days, if you were associating with a known, you know, uh, a felon, prior felon man, or yeah. something along those lines, you could be violated and put back in jail. Yeah. Now, we're able to communicate, to work with each other, to say, yo, yeah. you need a job? Yo, they got jobs over here. Yeah. Yo, Networks. you need some help? Yo, Exodus got a place for you to stay over here. And, and to make yeah. a difference in our community. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and this is why this create this platform is created, was created. Man. Absolutely. Let me ask you to our listeners that's out there. Mm -hmm. If they wanted to get in touch with you, if they wanted to follow your story, if they wanted to follow your movement on what you're doing, how can they reach you? Oh, listen, all you got to do is watch TV every once in a while. <laughs> nah, but seriously, um, there's a lot going on. So... Um, the easiest way to get to me is through social media. You know, if you personally know me, then you can get my personal number, but that's not happening here, yeah. right? <laughs> so, um, plug in your social yeah, media. Let's JJ for Justice, either on the gram or TikTok. You can also put my name in on Facebook, John Adrian Velasquez or John Adrian JJ Velasquez. You're going to see that. There's a website, Free John Adrian Velasquez. It's been up for since I was incarcerated. It's still up. You know, like, I, I'll go and check all that. But, like, I'm most active on the gram, TikTok, sometimes Facebook. Um, listen, Google me. Google me, and it's going to be a whole lot of stuff that's going to come up. Absolutely. You know, it's been all types of documentaries I've been involved with, all types of podcasts. That's success after lockdown. Yeah. Like, that's, I, I know, you know, there's a lot of brothers and sisters that talk about it, right? And then when they walked out that door, it's like, ah, they forget about them. But you... Brother Eric, brothers from Hudson Lane, Exodus, creating a platform, a voice yeah. for the ones that are in there, for the ones that are still out here to try to change the dynamics That's of right. our people. Because if we don't take control and, and start leading our people into the right path, mm -hmm. we Somebody will be coming to the wrong in the wrong path, and we will right. become extinct. That's okay, right. and, and, and our people will just be incarcerated people. No That's question. it. No mm -hmm. question, so. Man. Yo, shout out again to you, brother. Thank, thank you, man. Thank you. Like again. Again, man, I just want to thank you <laughs> for coming through. Listen, man, know what I've I mean? been wanting to do it. It's you, just man. all about time. You know, no yeah, time is crazy, but um, you. And I got to make time for guys like y'all. Yeah. Appreciate, appreciate y'all. Appreciate what y'all doing. You know, and you got to keep it up, man. And definitely. The truth of the matter is, our power comes from amplifying our voices Absolutely. and sharing our testimony. So we gotta keep doing it. Success after lockdown is the shit. Make it happen, man. That's right. Peace. 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 For all our listeners out there, man, thank you for tuning in. Again, we had John Adrian Velasquez, uh, now known as JJ Justice. Please tune in to us at Success After Lockdown on Apple Podcast, Anchor, Spotify, YouTube. You can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. If you have somebody that you know that got a good successful story and want to reach out to us, you can always send us an email at successafterlockdown at gmail.com.